The following is an interview with Sir Roger Penrose, a prolific mathematician, physicist, and Nobel laureate. I had the honor of securing an interview with Mr. Penrose on Friday, July 9th, 2021. Here is our conversation. Style interview, and so I'm just going to be asking you general questions about, um, you know, your story coming up in academia, your work in academia, your theories uh, such as CCC and the the quantum basis of human consciousness and those kinds of things. Okay. Um, I don't know. Shall I start with... <clears throat> I mean, I could start with when I was a graduate student in Cambridge University because I was actually doing pure mathematics working in algebraic geometry. Um, having had my bachelor's degree in London University, University College. <clears throat> and although I was meant to go to various courses and uh, relevant to my uh, particular interest, what, what the my PhD topic would have been, um, I mainly... Well, there were three courses in particular which had nothing whatsoever to do with what I was supposed to be doing. One of them is a course by a man called Steen, S-T-W-E-N, who talked about uh, um, mathematical logic, in particular the idea of Turing machines, computability, and Gödel's theorem. And I was fascinated by this for various reasons. I also went to a course by Herman Bondi on general relativity, that's Einstein's theory of gravity. Um, and another course which I went to was by Paul Dirac, the great quantum physicist, who discovered the equation for the electron and antiparticles and various things like this. And uh, he gave a course on quantum mechanics. Right. And for various reasons, um, these things had a greater influence on me, I think, than maybe most of the courses that I should have been attending. Because um, I was in pure mathematics, and these were... Well, the logic one was still pure mathematics, but it, it was important to me because... Well, I'd, I'd heard about Gödel's theorem in a sort of vague way, and it's supposed to, I don't know if you know anything about it, it's supposed to be um, something, so I thought, something which you couldn't prove in mathematics, and I didn't like the idea of something that you couldn't prove. Um, but then when I actually went to the course, I, I realized what it was, that if you settle on a particular system of action, axioms and rules of procedure, so basically, if you like, an algorithmic procedure for deciding truth, then if you trust the procedure, that's to say, if it says, yes, that thing is true, and you believe by understanding how the things was built, that, that has to be true by virtue of that, then you can transcend the capabilities of the algorithm. So basically, that's what Gödel shows. He chose a, makes a statement, a mathematical statement, a very precise mathematical statement, which you can see must be true by virtue of your trust in the system. That is to say, by virtue of your trust that the if the system says you've proved something, it really is true. So if you're convinced of that, then you have to be convinced of the statement that Gödel produces, yet you are also convinced that it cannot be proved using the methods you have. And I found this very striking because it really means, basically, that our conscious understanding of mathematics is not a computation. That's really the way I interpret it. Is. So that what's going on in our heads, if you like, um, cannot be an algorithm, cannot be a computer program or something like this. And, of course, AI, which has been going on then and is going on to a much greater extent now, and people discuss these questions, but I've formed the view at that stage that what's meant by our understanding of something and how our understanding can give us truth in mathematics is not something that you could formalize and put on a computer. Although people argue with me on this, they <laughs> have many years since. I can't see it. They can really see the... I mean, you have to phrase the argument exactly correctly. Um, and more or less, it's, it's not an algorithm. I won't go into the details unless you, unless you query me more on that. 
But I was pretty convinced by that, that what goes on in our heads when we are consciously um, believing something or consciously understanding something, it's not following an algorithm. Right. And then I went to, the, I went to this course. These were all sort of simultaneous. The course by Bondi on general relativity, which uh, was important for me because that was sort of the main subject I had worked on afterwards with general relativity. The thing got the Nobel Prize was with a problem in general relativity. So that was a very important influence. And the third one was Dirac's lectures on quantum mechanics. And I remember his very first lecture, I think it was his very first lecture, which he was talking about the superposition principle in quantum mechanics. So if you have an atom, which could be in a particular state or a particular location or whatever it is, and if another possible state or location for that atom would be somewhere else, then you could have states, just as good states, which are what are called superpositions of the two. So it could be, if it could be in location A, that's one possible state, and if it could be in location B, is another possible state, then there are all sorts of states where it's both at A and B at the same time. And the way quantum mechanics works is you have to do that. Quantum mechanics a very fundamental um, building block of quantum mechanics, if you like, is the superposition principle, which is contained in this. And then after he described this for atoms, he took out a piece of chalk and started talking about why this piece of chalk could not be simultaneously in one place or another. And as he was describing this, I think my mind was drifting, and I was looking out of the window and thinking about something completely different. And so when my mind returned to what he was talking about, he'd gone on to the next topic. And I find this completely baffling, how it was that piece of chalks weren't found in two places at once. And uh, I had no idea what he said. I have a feeling it was something to, you know, that it was too much energy to put it into two places or something. I don't know, something to sort of calm me down and not worry about it. I guess that was the main hmm. point of the discussion. But you, you really have to swallow these things and not worry about them. Y yes. It was curious because I learned many, many years later that Dirac had the same problems with this as I did. And he believed that quantum mechanics was a provisional theory and that someday there would be a better theory which could resolve this particular conundrum. So basically what happened is you went to one class and they talked about uh, uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. And then you said, well... Yes. Uh, so if this theorem is is uh, for real, then that means that uh, you know um, consciousness cannot be explained via some kind of computational mechanism. And then yeah. you went over to this other class, and they explained yeah. uh, quantum superpositions. And then, and so you basically said, well, uh, gee, if it's not computational, I guess it must be uh, quantum in nature. Yes, I guess I should explain more of the argument from there on, if you like. And I think the combining gravity with it was probably not initially... I'm not sure when I became pretty convinced that, that the gravity, bringing gravity into quantum mechanics was the crucial thing. But what I did think was that whatever is going on in the reduction of the states... You see, well, in quantum mechanics, the, the sort of dogma is that it's when a measurement is made. You see, you can have a quantum state, which is a superposition of being in, in location A and location B, but then you make a measurement on this state, and the process of measurement turns the superposition into a probability of one or the other. And that's the way you do quantum mechanics. Whenever you make a measurement, you take these superpositions and you say, okay, well, it's not really a superposition of one or or the, one and the other at the same time, it becomes one or the other, with probabilities or given by the, the quantum by the, what are called the amplitudes attached to each location. And so that's the procedure you use, which is called the Born rule, or um, making a measurement, you see. But it doesn't resolve the issue, as far as I'm concerned, because after all, what's making a measurement? You have some piece of device which measures it, you see. And if that piece of device which is measuring it surely should be treated as a quantum system too. And so therefore it doesn't actually measure A or B. It is 
in the superposition itself of being A or B. Now, there were various people, I think Wigner most particularly, and curiously I did have discussions with Wigner about this when I was in Princeton later on, who believed, I don't know whether he believed it, it was certainly toyed with the idea that it was the conscious perceiver that reduced the state. So you had to have a conscious being seeing whether the state was A or B, and that somehow the conscious perception of it would make it either A or B. And I think von Neumann was supposed to have a similar view. Now, I found this, I don't know whether initially I was accepting of these ideas, but I find this very implausible. And to give you a, a sort of picture of, I don't think I had this particular picture initially, but it's one I sometimes give. Imagine there's a distant planet, and on this planet there is no living being whatsoever. No conscious being, certainly. Now, we believe there's a sort of thing called the butterfly effect, which means that the weather on this planet could be triggered by something, you know, by the flapping of the wing of a butterfly. Ultimately, ultimately it could be due to quantum effects, so that there could be quantum superpositions of different weathers. And if there's nothing to reduce the state, no conscious being there, or any, the weather of that planet would be a quantum superposition of all these different weathers. Okay, well, now there's a, people on Earth decide they want to look at this planet, so they send a space probe, probe, space probe to the, it takes several light years, you see, so it's probably, you know, about four years from when they set it off, and it takes a photograph of this superposition of weathers, and on its way back, finally, it can transmit a signal back to the people on Earth of what the image of this weather is. And somebody looks at the computer screen. This is the first time a conscious being has, in, has encountered this superposition of weathers. And that conscious being suddenly sees it as one weather. And so this has got to go back to the space probe, and it's got to go back and change all the weather on the planet, just because some stupid person on the Earth happens to have looked at it. Mm -hmm. And it just makes no sense whatsoever to me. So I never believed that way around. It's not the conscious being that reduces the state. It's something else. So what I did come to believe, this took many years, to sort of coming around to the view, but I think by the time I wrote my book, The Emperor's New Mind, um, which was in the late 80s, I lost track of when it was, um, I had formed a view, not quite correct in my current opinion, but formed a view that it was the gravitational influence, not the conscious influence, but the gravitational influence, which made the state become either one or the other. So it could be in position A or position B, simply because the gravitational fields get uncomfortable when they're in a superposition and they reduce themselves to one or the other. And I have a, I've sort of developed this idea in papers since then to formulate a, a more precise criterion of how much displacement of mass and how far you move it and how uh, long do you have to wait before it gets reduced to one or the other. And uh, I, I've written papers on that. Uh, Hmm. So far, nobody has tested this scheme. But it doesn't say anything about consciousness. You see, that's simply independent of consciousness. But you see, the, the lectures by Steen led me to believe that there, it's the other way around. You see, it's completely opposite to the view that's often expressed, that somehow consciousness reduces the state. It's the reduction of the state which produces consciousness. So the idea there was that you want to find something which does not have a, an equation governing its behavior, which makes it completely deterministic, and uh, um, there's no role for, for a conscious influence on what goes on. Uh, and the idea is that that comes in when in the brain somehow there is a conscious, so there is a superposition between two States which get reduced to one or the other, and that's accompanied by a conscious experience. Or you could say it's the conscious experience which is making it do one or the other, or however you want to phrase it. Hmm. And so I kind of phrased this in the book without really having any idea how that might work. I, you see, I had this sort of uh, over, um, 
I don't know, I'm afraid to do what I might be, be where I might have got by the end of the book. And I tried to learn all, all about, well, as much as I could, about neurophysiology. And I learned, learned about nerve transmission and all this. And at the end of it, I just thought there's no chance. Nerve transmission will, will um, the, the electric fields will disturb the rest of the brain, and there's no way of preserving coherence to the level. <laughs> so, so I sort of rather vaguely gave up at that point and made a few statements which I didn't really believe, but possibly of some relevance, and left it left it dangling at the end of the book. But then Stuart Hammeroff, who is a neurophysiol a neuro sorry. I'm getting my words jumbled up here. Anesthesiologist. He's a neurophysiologist, too. He's, right. he's an anesthesiologist at the University of uh, Arizona mm-hmm. at Tucson. And uh, he, his day job or night job, or whichever way around it is, is to put people to sleep or to put people under general anesthetics, which is what he does. But unlike most of his colleagues who just do it, he was very puzzled about what he's actually doing when he's doing it. How does how do general anesthetics turn off consciousness? And this was his angle on this. And he formed a belief, um, I'm not quite sure how far back, but certainly before my book, that consciousness had to do with these little tiny structures which has to be found in most cells, all, all cells except, I think, red blood cells in, in the body, but they, particularly in brains, but, but that was, they are, these are called microtubules. Mm-hmm. So these are little tiny tubes. Um, and he wrote to me, and uh, having read my book, The Emperor's New Mind, and said, that I, more or less, I gather you don't know about these microtubules. Um, I think you might find them interesting. And I get lots of letters from crackpots of various kinds and say, you know, this is another one. But then I realized these are real things. And I found them far more promising than nerve transmission because they're little tubes, much, much smaller, and they have a very strong symmetry about them, which I thought was a good indication of a possibility to preserve coherence, quantum coherence, at at a a strong level. So I wrote back to him, and we got together, and we formulated a view which is still going strong, which we can call the orc OR theory. Orc means orchestrated. OR means objective reduction of the quantum state. Mm-hmm. Or, and it also spells OR. You see, that's a sort of acronym. It spells OR. It means either this happens or that happens, mm-hmm. rather than being main, maintained in a quantum superposition of this happening and that happening. So it's, the, it's when these superpositions become one or the other. And they don't do that in standard quantum mechanics. So this means going outside standard quantum mechanics to try and understand the objective reduction of the quantum state and to see how on earth that could be playing a role. You have to preserve the coherence at a very surprising level inside neurons, well, inside microtubules, organized appropriately, and uh, that's that's the theme which we've been... Well, they do most of the work on this. I just occasionally come in and, and pontificate about something, and then, then they do some more work. So that's... Uh, but it's, it's an interesting... I, I always call it a sideline, because that, I really don't know... I, I don't know enough biology. I, I, I just have to take my word, them, their word for it. And they talk to my me about all these um, structures, which I don't really understand, like tryptophan and... And all these things, and right. what do I know about them? Not very much. But I do have some ideas, which have developed since then, about how the reduction of the state. It's, it's really a very curious phenomenon, um, and it's quite curious because um, I've been thinking about these things for quite a long time, but not really got around to writing anything about it. And when the lockdown started, I guess last summer, whenever it was, I decided I would start writing some notes on my ideas about state reduction. And these were just sent around to various colleagues and friends and other people who who got interested. 
not dumb history or anything like that, but just explaining various ideas and puzzles and paradoxes, seeming paradoxes, and how relativity fits in with the collapsed notion, which, which is very curious, some of these things. You have to look at it in quite a serious way. And this got sort of stagnated as soon as I got a Nobel Prize because <laughs> too many other things interrupted and I really haven't got around to doing... It got to a point where it was really saying something quite serious about certain theories of state reduction couldn't be right, mm. um, which was a little bit of a shock to some people. Um, but it has to be it has to be more surprising than one might think. And there are various tests of... Various, you see, there is a, a theory which is referred to as the Diyoshi Penrose model, which people in Italy had written a paper about in, in last autumn, I think it was, where they seem to have disproved what they call the Diyoshi Penrose model. And I don't mind them disproving that one because it's not my model. The thing about Diyoshi, he's a Hungarian who actually had the particular criterion I had for the reduction of state. He had it before me, about a couple of years before me. So he was certainly first on that, no question. But he didn't have a, a motivation from the principles of general relativity. So my, my, I presented arguments which showed that something like this really has to be true. That his arguments were based on a particular kind of model for the reduction of the state. And that particular kind of model I, I don't go along with. I think, I think they're not, they're not uh, revolutionary enough, if you like. They're too close to, to conventional theories. You've got to do something a bit wilder. And so the particular theory that was referred to as the Diyoshi Penrose model is certainly not my model. The experiments that they were doing had to do with, to give you a rough idea, you see, if you have a, a superposition, say, of uh, an atom being in location A and being in location B, then there might be some probability of it jumping to being either A or B. Now, if you're thinking of this as a sort of dynamical process, then these little jumps are happening all the time, and they cause a sort of heating in the, in the body. So you might have a what they call spontaneous heating because these the jumps, which are the sort of spontaneous reduction of the state, which is going on all the time, would um, be something you could measure. And these people have to isolate some objects and they put it down a mine shaft and see whether they can see any of this spontaneous heating. And they don't see it. Mm. Okay. So this says, well, these theories must be wrong. Well, they probably are, but it's not the sort of theory I have. Right. Partly because it's a little bit a stretch of the imagination. You see, you have to say that these reductions, you see, the thing becomes a superposition of A and B. And after a little while, you can calculate the length of time using this kind of Diyoshi criterion. How long does it take before it becomes one or the other? Now, you see, the ordinary picture people have is that superposition jumps to one or the other. But my view is it doesn't. What it does, it's as though it was one or the other all the time. It goes back to where it became a superposition of two things. And it becomes very tricky because you've got to make the whole thing consistent and not violating causality ideas and things like that. But it does have implications which are probably testable with regard to consciousness, if, if that consciousness is part of it. In fact, there were experiments that were done, I think, in the 1970s, 80s, I can't remember exactly when, which I sometimes go back to because they do indications, it indicate something like this. Experiments due to Benjamin Libet. So you're saying that and things uh, can go back into superposition after collapsing? Well, it, no, you see, it goes back to being one or the other, you see, the superposition, imagine the thing separating. You wrote a thing in one location. Then as time evolves, because of the quantum evolution, 
it becomes slightly two, two slightly separated positions, both at once. And then they separate a bit more and a bit more and a bit more until they become quite a substantial separation. And then, according to the theory, the state reduces to become one or the other. But the way you look at it, not as though it's that feudal position suddenly becomes one or the other, but as though the choice of it became one, becoming one or the other actually was in a certain sense, virtually made right at the beginning. So it's the one track of that. If you think of the, the particle as going, well, it's not really a part of it, because that's, if it was actually a particle, the length of time is so enormously long that you don't see anything. It has to be some substantial object, which is put into a superposition of being in location A and B. But A and B are very close together, first of all. Then they separate far enough, and then this state becomes, so the stuff becomes unstable, and it becomes either A or B. But when it's become either A or B, it's as though it was all the time A, or all the time B, and it was never in the secret position. So this leads to a very curious picture of how causality works, and you've got to make sure that it doesn't land you into paradoxes, which yeah. people call grandfather paradoxes. <clears throat> these things when you you know have a movie and some I guess what, what was that movie when somebody went back in time and then you, you have to do something to change the future and it comes back again <laughs> yeah t- time travel paradoxes you, it's not good yes right and so you, you get you get killing your grandfather is what they usually call you see and so they call it a grandfather paradox yeah I didn't see why you have to kill your grandfather that's a little extreme <laughs> <laughs> still, that's the way it's called that, they usually call it a grandfather paradox so you've got to avoid that kind of thing clearly that can't be right if you could do that that's clearly nonsense. So the gist so of what you're saying... careful. The, the gist is that uh, the way that the superposition... Call, and by the way, I don't know anything about physics, so uh, please <laughs> have mercy on me here, but so you say the way that the superposition collapses is sort of uh, predetermined. It's not decided right there on the spot when it does. Well, it's, you could call it predetermined, but is it? I mean, that's a good question, you see. What does... what does, See, one thinks of determination in a normal temporal way where you could say it's predetermined, but then you might in the middle do something else which changed that supervision to something else. So you have to be very careful about that. Um, yeah, I mean, it leads you into into potentially paradoxical situations. Right. And you have to be damn careful that these don't actually give you a paradox. Um, so you attribute, um, you say that, uh, consciousness, human consciousness, our sort of ability to, um, uh, think is, uh, largely, largely due to, uh, basically quantum mechanisms. Uh, so, and I was fascinated. That's what we have to say about think. I'm talking about conscious thinking. Right. Because there's an awful lot that goes on in the brain, which is not conscious. The most prominent is the cerebellum, which has got more neurons in it than the cerebrum. The normal, people we normally think of as the brain, you know, the, the part with all the crinkles in it at the top. But just sort of at the back and underneath is the cerebellum, which is organized completely differently. It seems to be entirely unconscious. It has more neuro- neurons in it than the cere- cerebrum. It doesn't cross over. The right-hand side controls the right-hand side, the left controls the left. It's much more like what you would do if you if you built a computer to try and control the system. So it's probably like a computer. I wouldn't be at all surprised if you could, in principle at least, model the action of a cerebellum with an electronic computer. It has to be a pretty big one because it's, there are an awful lot of neurons there. Mm-hmm. But um, maybe. I have nothing against that because mm-hmm. that's entirely unconscious. Uh, and the, I think I've heard that uh, the concentration of microtubules uh, is much higher in the parts of the brain that are, that are thought to be responsible for conscious thought rather than reflexive thought, like the cerebellum. Is that yeah, right? This is an interesting question. I think a lot of these things are not very clear at the moment. Hmm. You see, you have to talk to Stuart Hameroff, and he'll give you his view. <laughs> and I have to rely on him because... I, you know, he knows much more about these things than I do. But his view is, <clears throat> and it does make sense to me, for various rather complicated reasons, 
but it's it's sort of this. I think about four layers down. You still have to go to the. It's in the cerebrum, but it's not the very outside part of the cerebrum. You have to go in a little bit. And this is where you find these cells, which are called pyramidal cells. And these pyramidal cells have very large numbers of microtubules in them, organized in a different way from microtubules in other cells. And the, what's cr crucial from my perspective is that the cerebellum doesn't have any pyramidal cells in it. Mm. So it's quite possible that this is the seat of consciousness. Now, I, I don't have an independent view of this because my understanding of, of neurophysiology is, is pretty limited and a lot of it is based on what Stuart tells me. But it does seem very plausible, something like that. And, it, and it's also true, see, what's sort of paradoxical about it? And this goes back to the Libet experiments. I don't know, have you looked at my book, The Emperor's New Mind? Unfortunately, I did not have enough time to uh, secure a copy of any of your th your three books. Yes. Well, you see, The Emperor's New Mind, I mean, I say it's out of date in some way. We, I wrote this before I knew about microtubule. Yeah, I think you said that The, the Emperor's New Mind was uh, inspired by Stephen Hawking? No. No, not at all. Maybe those different. Okay. It was slightly spurred on by Stephen Hawking. <laughs> right, okay. He was writing his book. He was writing uh, The Brief History of Time, you see. Yeah, and then Carl Sagan uh, did his foreword. And, uh, Carl Sagan did the foreword, you see. Then it, that made you see and that. And I remember uh, asking at one point, I asked Stephen, I said, um, are you writing this book when you came to give the best Oh, no, I'm writing this book to make money. <laughs> <laughs> So he got he got um, Carl Sagan to write a forward, and it made a big splash, certainly. Yeah. And, and my book was being written at the same time, I think it came out much later. So I decided I needed to have somebody significant to write a forward. So I wrote to Martin Gardner, um, and he I, I had no idea what his views on these things were. And he was said, yes, I completely agree with you. He said, yes, yes, I like it. He did a very nice forward, actually. Hmm. So I thought, I thought if nobody else had written any forward, that the book would disappear without trace. But since Martin Gardner wrote one, I thought maybe a few people would look at it. Yes. They did. Well, so, it certainly has not disappeared. Um, so it's not uh, quite like the brief history of time, but it was uh, <laughs> made a bit of a success. That's true. Um, so, you know, obviously, a lot of people are fascinated by the idea of. Um, uh, one's own conscious thoughts being based in uh, based on some kind of quantum mechanism. I hope I'm uh, yes. saying that correctly. The thing is, you see, people even say that in thinking that's amazing and miraculous. But you see, quantum mechanisms on their own aren't good enough. You see, I think when I started to get involved with these things with Stuart Hammeroff, as you say, you know, people would be, you know, quantum mechanics and biology? Gosh, impossible. Well, first of all, it was struck me as ridiculous because quantum mechanics is the basis of chemistry. And chemistry is important to biology. So why do you say quantum mechanics can't be important to biology? Well, chemistry. I mean, good God, it's quantum mechanics all the way through. So the fact that it's quantum mechanics is nothing new, nothing important. I mean, it's important, but it's nothing outrageous. It's just that people have forgotten that chemistry is entirely quantum mechanics. Hmm. They've just forgotten that. They think, oh, that's chemistry. That's not quantum mechanics, that's chemistry. But chemistry depends on quantum mechanics. You know, you can't have atoms, and you can't have chemical bonds. It's just all kind of quantum mechanics, right, from start to end. I don't know. Sorry, I'm just ranting and raving. I do that from time to time. <laughs> but then you see eventually people found there were sort of non-chemical quantum mechanic effects in central biological, one of the most important ones is photosynthesis. So photosynthesis, photosynthesis is a quant distinctly quantum, non-chemical quantum process. So there, and that's, that's absolutely fundamental to biology. So we've already got quantum, fe quantum features in that sense, non-biological quantum mechanics playing a big role. And also things like bird migration, the, ma the magnetic, the fact they can sense magnetic fields. Yeah, there was just an be... article about that recently. Is that right? That's interesting, yes. Yeah, how they... Uh... So that seems to... Yeah. 
Oh, there's the, it's uh, a quantum mechanism that's at the, sort of the, uh, the the heart of their ability to uh, sense magnetic fields like that. So, yes, no, I think it's very remarkable. Yes, but you see, it's, it's, it's only people are just realizing how quantum non let's call them non chemical because I'm I'm sorry, quantum <laughs> chemistry is quantum mechanical right but from beginning to end. But if you forget that fact then, okay, these things are the first few occasions, bird migration and photosynthesis, and I think there's some others, I forgot what they are, are the first few things where you can see a non-purely chemical quantum process in biology. But there are probably far more such things going on, non, non-purely chemical biological processes which are fundamentally quantum mechanical. But you see, what I'm saying is more outrageous than that. I'm saying that it is beyond quantum mechanics. That is to say, it is where quantum mechanics goes wrong. Standard quantum mechanics makes no sense. Sorry, I shouldn't say it quite so bluntly. I mean, you know, people like Einstein and Schrodinger and Dirac were more polite. What they said is that quantum mechanics is incomplete. And there is no theory which describes... the measurement process or the reduction of the quantum state. And certainly Einstein had that view and Schrodinger had that view. So, so two, of the ba- two of the founders of quantum mechanics. And another of the founders of quantum mechanics, Paul Dirac. Although he was much more, you had to, had to hurt, search for his writings to find a good quote because he never, he was very, very cautious about expressing his opinions. I think in later life he got a bit less cautious. And you can find it, in one of my books, I gave a good quote, from Dirac, where you can see, he says, quantum mechanics is a provisional theory. It needs something to explain the reductions, the measurement process. Something beyond quantum mechanics. You see, because quantum mechanics, as it exists, is an inconsistent theory. Because you can't make measurements. If you follow what's called unitary evolution, that is, if you like, the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is an equation which is deterministic. You put your initial state in, the Schrodinger equation chugs along, chugs along, chugs along, and out, out comes the state half an hour later. And that's the Schrodinger equation. Mm-hmm. Now, if you've done a measurement in the middle, that's not the answer you get out of it. Now, what's doing the measurement mean? Well, you've got a measuring device. Well, surely you put that in the system, too. So if the measuring device is part of the quantum system, surely it just chugs along and follows the Schrodinger equation. There's no measurement in that. There's no reduction of the quantum state. So there's an inconsistency. The quantum mechanics is fundamentally inconsistent. It's not just puzzling and confusing and all these other things, which it is too, but it's also inconsistent. And people put the blame on it being puzzling and confusing, whereas it's actually inconsistent with itself because you can't make measurements in the evolution of the quantum state in the Schrodinger equation. There's no room for a measurement. The measurement is something external. But what's external mean? Because it's only a, bit, a slightly bigger part of the universe. <laughs> so it doesn't make sense. I should explain that there are all sorts of other views than the one I'm expressing. And you'll find a multitude of views, which is one of the troubles. And One of the most particular you find in Oxford, amongst the philosophers here, is the view called the many worlds view. Yeah. First, sort of, officially enunciated by by, um, Hugh Everett III. I think at the instigation of John Wheeler, because I think John Wheeler sort of believes it already, which is to say that yes, all these superpositions of states do evolve, and the universe consists of all these alternatives coexisting. But somehow, our conscious being, I don't know quite how it's supposed to work, because I've never understood that part, a conscious being threads its way through this multitude of, of superposed alternatives and seems to make sense of it being only one alternative. But quite how that is supposed to work, you have to ask an Oxford philosopher, don't ask me because I've never been able to understand. Although I did, there was, I have a theory that to, to be um, a good um, a quantum philosopher or something, whatever the right word is, you have to have spent a part of your life believing in the many worlds theory. 
So you're yeah, not buying the many time. worlds. Yes. No, I did. I did. You have to. I don't know how long I believed in it. Shouldn't be more than about a month, I think. <laughs> and then you have to realize that, that can't be the answer. Okay. So some other people are taking quite a bit longer, but uh, a bit longer than a month. Yeah. So, so you're <laughs> saying that uh, uh, current uh, quantum mechanics is basically provisional. Um, does that mean that yeah. the Schrodinger equation is going to be replaced with something better down the line, or something more accurate? Maybe. That might be a way of looking at it. I, you see, I think it's rather more subtle than that. The Schrodinger equation has its role to play. It doesn't completely describe reality. But there is a certain point at which... You see, I, I have made various arguments which are just very explicit. The one which I think I like the best is to show that there is an incompatibility between the foundational principles of general relativity and quantum mechanics. And the foundational principle of quantum mechanics I'm regarding as the superposition principle. So if, so if A, the evolution A can take place and if the evolution B can take place, then the evolution of A and B in all these superpositions can take place as well. So that's the superposition principle in quantum mechanics. Now, the principle in general relativity, a very fundamental basic principle, is the Galileo-Einstein principle of equivalence, which really says, and it's really Galileo, and he's dropping in his big rock and a little box from the Leaning Tower, even though he probably didn't do that himself, but he certainly speculated that if you drop a big rock and a little rock from the leaning tower of Pisa, apart from air resistance, he was very careful to say air resistance and make a difference, the two rocks will drop together. So if you imagine a little insect sitting on the big rock looking at the little one, as the thing drops, the little insect sees the other, the little rock hovering as so though there were no gravity. So basically the point is that locally at least, you can cancel out the gravitational field by falling freely with it, with it. So that is the principle of equivalence. And Einstein took that basic principle and made it into a theory. I mean, it's absolutely astounding how he was able to do that because it's sort of inconsistent in various ways. You can, you can do it locally, but when, the curve, when, you see, when you move around the Earth, then the direction of the gravitational field changes as you go around. So you can't get rid of it with, by one acceleration. The acceleration directions change as you, as you move around the Earth. So it's got to be a much more subtle theory. But locally, the statement is you can get rid of it by falling freely. So you get rid of gravity. So then I put a little argument, which I think is not, nothing wrong with it. Nobody's contradicted me on this. You put a little argument where you imagine doing an experiment in a lab where you want to take into, into consideration the Earth's gravitational field. Now, you just follow the Schrodinger equation. You just put in all the terms and, and you know, Hamilton and Mr. Bill and so and you evolve according to the Schrodinger equation. Now, you've got two ways you might do it. One is just think of gravity as just another force. So you do what's called put a term in the Hamiltonian. That's, I'm sure that sounds like gobbledygook to you, but <laughs> that's what you do. You, see, you, take, you deal with the gravitational field by just considering the Earth's field is just another kind of force, like an electromagnetic force or nuclear force or what it happens to be. For all these others, you would, quote, put a term in the Hamiltonian, unquote. Mm -hmm. So this would be the procedure you do. It's perfectly straight, straightforward procedure. Okay, that, you can do that. That's one way of getting your answer. Okay, you can do another way. And you imagine Einstein sitting in the corner and say, oops, whoops, I should have been doing it your way, shouldn't I? His way would be to say, you just consider a freely falling frame. You imagine your, your coordinates drop, if you like, freely. And then there is no gravitational field. Mm -hmm. You just do the whole thing all over again. You do all your calculations all over again in your freely falling frame and see how it compares with the other way of doing it. Curiously enough, and it is really rather striking, they come out as almost exactly the same. But the almost is the crucial thing. No, I can't be explain this without being slightly technical, but there is a thing called a phase factor. So you, your wave function is almost exactly the same in the two procedures, but there is a thing called a phase factor, 
which multiplies the whole wave function. Now, usually people say, who cares about the phase factor? You just throw it away. It doesn't make any difference. Mainly because you're interested in probabilities, measurements, and all that stuff. And when you do measurements, the phase factor disappears. You don't see it. So it doesn't make any difference, you say. Okay. But then you say, well, maybe you should look a little more carefully at the phase factor. And then you look more carefully at it. And then you see it's actually telling you something a bit serious. It's telling you that the two ways of doing this procedure are actually, technically, what are called different quantum field theory vacua. Again, I would be too technical to try and explain it. But there are two different ways of formulating your quantum field theory. That would be all right if you've only got one gravitational field and then it doesn't make any difference. Again, you could say, who cares? Again, it's just a phase factor, who cares? Oh, I see. Makes the vacuum different, doesn't it? Well, who cares? I'll stick to my own vacuum and then it's fine. Okay. The trouble comes only when you try to do something a little more serious. And that is not just consider the Earth's field, but as part of your experiment, you put a big lump in it, say a, a rock. I'm imagining, let's make it much smaller than a rock, a grain of sand. You put this grain of sand in your experiment, and as part of the experiment, you put this little grain of sand in being in a superposition of two places at once, A and B. Now, you have a little bit of a problem. Because you imagine, as I say, the little insect sitting, in, sitting on the grain of sand or something, it thinks that the gravitational field of the grain of sand has to be taken care of in the Einsteinian way. But then this leads you to an inconsistent vacuum with the way the, in, the, in the other location of the grain of sand. And you go through a complicated calculation. You see, yeah, you, it doesn't work. There is a little bit of a problem. And then you can show what that problem is, and you work it out, and it's a sort of measure of an energy. And it tells you this is an energy uncertainty of the system. And then you say, energy uncertainty, that relates to Heisenberg's time energy uncertainty. And you think about unstable particles, where you have an energy uncertainty because it's an unstable particle. So unstable things have an energy uncertainty. So this means this state in which the body is in the superposition of two locations is unstable and it has a lifetime and that lifetime can be calculated by this formula and the lifetime is that it will go to one or the other in a certain length of time and this gets you up to the Dioshi formula which I told you before so that it's a thing you might be able to measure to see whether the reduction of the state actually is a physical process with an honest lifetime, which you could test experimentally. So, um, you, you say, and so, okay, so you say that, uh, uh, qu- you know, the, the quantum mechanics as we know it is provisional. You say that uh, conscious thought is um, based largely on quantum mechanisms, and so this would suggest that, uh, that, we, that we don't understand as much as we think we do about the way that uh, human consciousness works or the way that, um, yeah, the, well, the way that it works. So, and so I was fascinated to see you on VPro um, saying that these, so um, you say that there might be something true amongst uh, all these crazy ideas in reference to life after death and reincarnation. So uh, well, I don't think I said anything about that. <laughs> I see. Okay. Uh, I think I'm steering clear of that. My okay. My because mistake. you see, yeah, no, no. I, I think if it goes under that area, I think I would be cautious about it. Would you want to make? I, mean, a... I don't, can't, quite honestly, I don't know what I think. You see, okay. what I would say is that I don't believe any religious doctrine that I've ever heard of. Okay. Um, Put it like that. Okay. I don't. I think that there is something going on. I mean, people talk about life after the death. That I don't believe either, in the sense of having a continuation of one's consciousness in which the memories that one had previously are retained. That I find extremely hard to believe. I mean, it could be possible. So I'm not saying I believe this. I don't mm-hmm. know what I believe, because I think... You know, I would say, if it, if, if it comes to religious views, 
I'm not an agnostic, I'm an atheist. But if it comes to views of what consciousness is about or what life is about or whether we anything happens after death and that kind of stuff, I would say I'm an agnostic there. Not that I'm an atheist there because it's not really a view that I'm not believing. It's just I don't know what on earth's going on. I mean, it could well be. I can speculate all sorts of wild things which I don't really believe. The trouble is sometimes I speculate too much. And people say I believe that, but I don't. Mm. It's just that there's clearly something mysterious about consciousness. And uh, whether it has makes any sense to say there is a continuation of consciousness after death, I don't know. Okay. It would not be anything in which, you know, with these views that somehow you have the same memories and you can and you get together with your parents and your grandparents and your great 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 grandparents and all that stuff. I mean, don't believe any of that at all. So that's not what I believe. But it may be that you have a it's a bit like some people who get bonked on the head or something and then they seem to forget everything and they and they have another life. Maybe it comes back later on, but there was a sort of starts again in some sense which doesn't retain any memory of what happened before. So that kind of thing would not be impossible in my view. It's not, I'm not saying I believe it. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that I'm more open-minded about such a view than I am about any religious view. So I, I suppose what you're saying is that uh, until we have the rules, you know, properly figured out, yes. it's difficult to rule out uh, some things like that. Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, all right. Well, well, maybe maybe they will come. If you understand consciousness enough, and some kind of view will come around, because oh yeah, you you float through into the next eon, and then you I'm so nervous. And you know, I'm not trying to say. so it's true that we don't you know know the rules. I think you've um, made a very uh, good argument about uh, about how uh, you know quantum me quantum mechanics is provisional, and um, there's some other things that you point out where we we don't understand it having to do with CCC, and um, so and it brings my mind back to when uh, Dirac, I think you said that so uh, you know you were in his class and he kind of dem he was talking about superposition and yeah, this right. kind of um stunned you in a way and so you you were taken aback by this uh and yes, so I don't think it's, if it, it's probably easy I always thought well I don't know about it I always thought but I sometimes think that it was a good thing that I was not paying too much attention to his explanation because I you see I think if you're going to do quantum mechanics you've got to have some something to calm you down and take and really believe and accept that you don't have an answer to that question. Exactly. So uh, what I'm very, very interested in is uh, when it comes to all this uncertainty, you know, um, does that bother you? Does it, you know, because I, I personally find it kind of difficult to reconcile with the fact that there, that we, yeah, we're not quite sure of what the rules really are in terms of physics. And, yeah. uh, you know, there's still a lot of things... Um, yeah, we just don't really know how it works. There's a lot of weird possibilities. So, does yes. it bother well, you think, at all? Yes. I'm not sure I would take the word bother. I mean, certainly... I mean, there are certain things in, in, in things that I do which I don't, I don't know the answer to, but I could conceive of finding my way to an answer. Well, this is like this. I can't really see them. <laughs> it's it's just uh, see maybe one has some answer to what kind of structures in the world could become conscious. I mean, how conscious is an octopus? Maybe one can make some statements. I, I personally have to think octopus, octopuses are are pretty conscious. Mm. Yeah, so they definitely display uh, a yeah. lot of intelligence. They do. That was a wonderful description. I, I've heard several octopus stories. The one I liked the best, I think, was a woman who, who was feeding the octopuses. There was a whole row of them, these tanks, and she was going, she had to put these little crayfish in, 
the one and the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. She got to the end and then she walked back and she could see the first octopus was just looking at her, eyeing her. And he held up this little crayfish and he dumped it down the drain. <laughs> mm. I thought that is a pretty good signal. <laughs> yes. My goodness. So, uh, uh, if we could talk for a moment. So, one of the r- most remarkable things about your story is that um, in the beginning, you uh, struggled academically, uh, is what I've read. Is that true? Depends what struggled means. If you talk about my, my experiences at school, you see, I, I, I uh, went to school during the Second World War years. My, my family went to the U.S. initially, then to Canada, London, Ontario. Mm. And so I spent the war years in London, Ontario. So this was, I was reached the age of eight when I was there, and then I left at the age of 14, I guess it was. Mm. And I remember in my early years, this was my first class, I think it was, and there was a woman I never really got on with. She was called um, uh, Miss Watson. Yes, Miss mm. Watson. And she had two classes next to each other. One was high grade two, and the other was low grade three. Now, I was in low grade three. And she decided at one point that I was too stupid and had to be moved down to high grade two. I think the reason was she used to have these mental arithmetic things. She she would do, you know, take seven and add five and divide by two and and multiplied by six and just sort of quickly, fairly quickly, one after the other. I'd always get lost. Mm. I would invariably get lost. And and I was also very slow. I was very bad at arithmetic and very slow. So I think that was her justification for moving me down one grade. And then she decided that I was a little too clever for to, to be in high grade, in low, what was it, high grade two, I should, and she couldn't place me somewhere between the two. So then she got rid of me, I think, just because she couldn't, she couldn't, didn't know what to do with me. So she moved, she, there were several people at some stage got moved up into high grade three. So, so I became part of that. A lot of people were very puzzled. What are you doing going up to high grade three? Right. So and so is much cleverer than you. Why wasn't he allowed to go up to high grade three? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I think she was just trying to get rid of me. Right. And I found high grade three much easier because I liked the teacher better. There was a t- the, the, I had one teacher called Mr. Stinnett, who I, I think had a bit of understanding. See, I never used to do terribly well in the arithmetic test or the math test. I would sort of you know, get about half marks or something. But what he noticed was that I was just too slow. So he decided, okay, it's all right, you can take, there's a play period after the end of the test, and so you can keep on going during that play period. Sometimes I went up even into the period beyond that, which was some other kind of period. As long as I was allowed to take as long as I liked, I got very good marks. So I was up there in the 90s, 98s, and things like that, so yeah, clearly I could do it. I was just much too slow. And I think it was the sort of thing like rather than memorizing my tables, I just sort of had to work them out each time. So, so if I wonder what seven times six was, I had to figure out what it was rather than remembering what it was. And so there were things like that mm. um, which held me back. But nevertheless, in the long run, it was probably very good because I, I felt I had to have a deeper understanding of what was going on. And I wasn't quick. There were certainly people much quicker than I was and who got better marks than I did. Right. Um, uh, so th- and so this, um, you know, the idea of a teacher giving you extra time um, yeah. is difficult for people to imagine in this age of one-size-fits-all education, at least in the United States. Do you know, do you have a sense of how unusual it was at that time in that place? I don't know. I think it was pretty unusual. Yes. No, it was certainly, it was a special thing he did for me. I don't quite know why. Hmm. Uh, He didn't do it for anybody else, as far as I know. Very strange, yes. And uh, I think he recognized something in me which was there. It wasn't I was just stupid. I don't know what it was. But um, what was it? He said, I had a brother, an older brother, Oliver, who was two years older than I was, and he was four years ahead of me at school. Wow. So he was, he was precocious. I mean, he, he was very, he was top of his class and two years younger than anybody else. I think there was one other person who, who was, he was one, just one part short of being top of the class, because he was two years younger than anybody else. 
Hmm. So he was precocious. <laughs> I wasn't like that. So, uh, and I had a younger brother who was much better than I was at games, like chess, you see. Yeah. He could beat me at chess, even though he was two years younger than I was. He did become British chess champion a record ten times. Wow. So, <laughs> so, uh, so it was a, a fairly competitive... And, and, but I didn't play chess. I just said, this is no use. I won't, I won't compete against him. There's no point. <laughs> so so it sound, that sounds like a pretty bad situation to be in where you're in this kind of exceptional family and, you know, you're not uh, uh, excelling yeah. on paper in schools. Was that a stressful experience for you? I don't know. I think, you see, I got on well with my father in... You see, he recognized something in me, I think. And we used to do things like make polyhedra, and uh, I think there was this initial experience. I remember having, I was looking at a pattern on a, on a ceramic pattern on, on a, I think it might have been on a sink top or on the floor. I think it was more like a sink top, which was regular hexagons. And you, you have this hexagonal pattern, and it makes a regular pattern. And I was looking at this, and I said to my father at one point, I said, look, suppose you continue this pattern to go all around the earth, and could you make it join up all the way around the earth? And he said, no, you can't do that. If it was pentagons, five-sided shapes, then you can, because you could have a dodecahedron. And he explained to me about that. And so we got together, and we made all these polyhedras, and we cut the corners off and made these different things, and... And this was a way I had to relate to my father. Hmm. And he recognized I had this playfulness and trying to understand things. And he was a geneticist, right? Yes, but he had definitely a mathematical bent. He loved mathematics as well. So hmm. although he, well, he knew my genetics with a fair amount of statistics. So he, he knew about statistics and that sort of thing. And he used to play with it in various unusual ways. So he, he, was, he had a mathematical skill, definitely. Also artistic. He was a very good artist. Hmm. His father was a professional portrait painter. So, very skilled. Um, so your father uh, was kind of able to see beyond the grades. He kind of uh, saw yes. kind of more yes, deeply. That was true. You see, he liked to connect with his sons. He connected with Jonathan, my younger brother, through chess. So he... You know, my father was a reasonable player, and sort of different kinds of, you know, he used to play variants of chess, things called rifle chess, and what was the other one? Losing chess. <laughs> All sorts of variants. Mm. They used to play around, and, and they used to play this game called Kriegspiel. This is a game where you have to have three players, and they used to go for long walks, and you had to play it in your head. No, no, sorry, proper Kriegspiel, you have three chess boards. Player A plays against player B. Player A knows where the white pieces are. Player B knows where the black pieces are. Player A plays with the white pieces. Player B with the black pieces. And then there's an umpire. And the umpire knows where both pieces are. And so you have to guess or try and infer where your opponent's pieces are. And you ask the umpire, say, can I go here? And he says, no, that's an illegal move. And he says, oh, well, let's try something else. And, okay, they play with three chess boards. What they used to do is go for long walks. One of my brothers were in front, my father in the middle, the other brother were at the back. And my father was the umpire, he would know what the chess was. The other two brothers were playing white and black in their heads. My father was also doing this doing in his head too, so all, all three of them were playing this game in their heads. What was I doing? I was the runner. So I would go to the back and I said to Jonathan, maybe said, what's your move? And he would say, uh, look, to king, look to King 7 or something. So I'd race along and say to my father, he says, look to King 7. And my father, oh, that's an illegal move. So I'd race back to Jonathan and say, no, you can't do that. So then I'd race back and he says, that's okay. So then I raced my other brother. He said, wow. he, he has to make this move. So he used to do that, yes. That is now, I, all I had to do was remember the move. Right. Whereas the other three of them, was, you see, my father knew all three could, he knew the whole position, and yes, but he knew the whole position. And Jonathan would know where his pieces were. He would try to infer where the other pieces were, and Oliver would be doing it the other way around. So, Oliver was a good chess player. He wasn't. He wasn't. Um, he was as good enough to become Cambridge University champion. Hmm. 
so that gives you some feeling. He wasn't good enough to be British champion. He did play the British championship once with Jonathan as well. And that's the first time Jonathan came out ahead, and I think Oliver decided to give up at that point. Right. Um, yes, but no, he, Jonathan was really very good. He, he was very... He didn't. He was not. So, he wasn't. Didn't have a sort of killer instinct, which I think he needed to have. He was much too, too uh, mild. And but he did. He did beat the world chess champion in a in a game. I think they had a, a match against the Russian team and that team, and, and he happened. To, that was just. I think he did beat the world champion at one point. It was only one game. <laughs> that is absolutely. That, you know that makes that me think uh, the story of you running the messages and your brothers keeping the boards in their head. This is a bit of a tangent, but uh, one time I was reading about Richard Feynman, who, Feynman, who, uh, he, he would yeah, ask yeah, his, when, when he, yeah. sorry? Yes, I used to know Feynman, yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Apparently he would talk uh, to his fellow physicist at uh, Los Alamos and, yes. and yeah. uh, ask them, if they were to keep a countdown timer in their mind, would they do it by sort of like having a voice countdown in their mind, or would they do it by having a visual kind of, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. A, a visualization of the numbers going down? And um, so, where do you fall on that spectrum? Are you mostly a visual kind of person, or? Yeah, definitely visual. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. That that question is. Uh, always fascinated me so but anyway so you were in canada at this time and uh yes how did you find canada did you like canada oh yes no it was kind of great time yes i remember when we said we were going back to england we always used to complain oh no we don't we, 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 no, we, we, we could, no we get on very well yes i had lots of friends so. right yes uh, sure. all right let's see what else is going on we got after the... okay so um I would like to talk a little bit about uh, conformal cyclic cosmology, but before we yeah. do, I want to... Um, so, okay, basically, I, you know, I don't know the details. I want, I want to get more details from you in, in a bit, but as I understand it, part of your sort of justification for this uh, hypothesis, I guess you call it, theory, um, is... Yeah, it's a theory, yeah. Okay. A theory, okay. So... Part of the justification is that when you look at the m cosmic microwave background, um, yeah. it's not highly ordered. It's like highly random, right? It, th this is basically... Yes, well, let, I can tell you the story, if you like. I mean, the story relates to the... It's, it's quite useful because when I talk about the Nobel Prize work, it's a natural evolution to the, the CCC, Conformal Cyclic Cosmology Picture. Because, you see, when I, I had my singularity theorem, which showed, basically, that if you had a gravitational collapse, so this is a body getting uh, too close to each other or a lot of too much material squashed in and a star which got too big or whatever it happens to be, and it's just not enough, and nothing, not enough pressure to keep it apart. Now, you see, the view was that maybe if it was complicated, it swish right. You see, there was a paper written in, nine, I think it was in 1939, just before the war, by Oppenheimer and Snyder. Oppenheimer, the same Oppenheimer of the atomic bomb fame. And he and his student, Snyder, wrote this paper, which was basically the description of a collapse to a black hole. But it was a dust so you had to consider material which was collapsing, which is what was called dust, which meant it had no pressure. So there was nothing to stop it collapsing. And the second point, even more important, was that it was exactly spherically symmetrical. So there was, as it falls inwards, it falls towards the center. So the fact that it falls to the center and the density becomes infinite at the central point is a sort of artifact you might say, okay, well, you see this in this model, but surely that's not really happens, because, first of all, there'd be a bit of pressure, and so it would stop pushing itself away. Secondly, more importantly, because there'd be irregularities. So it would swish around, do something very complicated, and come swirling out in some way. 
So there was this view that although Oppenheim and Snyder did have this, what you could call a collapse to a black hole, many people would not really believe it. I didn't really know how many people believed it or not, but uh, I sort of had seen this picture. But the question was, if you put irregularities in, you can put pressure in if you like, it doesn't actually make any difference, but you can put irregularities in, then it might swirl around and do something very complicated. So I formulated this theorem, which is what eventually got the Nobel Prize for me, which was a, an argument to show that it didn't matter. You could have all this swirling and squiggly, whatever you like, and it's still going to become singular. So you get these singular places where you can't evolve to, you can't, you get, you get stuck. And you mm -hmm. can't see what to do with it all. So it's the sort of image of what we have of a black hole. And um, so, so people were convinced. It took a long time for people to be persuaded by this argument, actually. Hmm. And it, partly because the Russians, there were two Russians, Lifshitz and Kalatnikov, who seemed to have proved the opposite, that in a completely general situation, you would not get singularities. And I did have a look at their paper. There was a crucial mistake in the paper, which I didn't spot, I have to say. I didn't look at it that carefully. But I didn't really see that you could get a totally convincing argument with that kind of procedure. I thought, well, I'm not sure I believe it. And so I went on my own track and looked at it from a different point of view and saw that, no, you can't get rid of this. You've got to get singularities. As long as the energies don't go negative or something crazy. So this was uh, the paper I wrote in... Well, I, I, I talked about it in 64. It was in 1965 when it was finally published. And mm -hmm. that's what apparently won the Nobel Prize, which after a few years. So these Russian <laughs> fellows kind of stymied progress in that area for a while. I guess they were not very long because, you see, their paper was out and it wasn't that much. It was only about a year or so before my mm -hmm. paper. But then there was a big argument. I remember there was a general activity conference in, in London and one of the Russians gave a proof, gave a lecture on this stuff. And Charlie Misner, he was a, I, I knew him very well. He was a student of John Wheeler's, worked with John Wheeler. And he actually, the argument I had, he produced an improvement over the argument. So I, learned, I learned a lot from Charlie Misner. He was, he was a good fellow. But anyway, he stood up at the end of this Russian lecture and said, look, this is contradicted by Penrose's theorem. And there was a big argument. Oh, gosh. And I was mm -hmm. sort of embarrassed at the back, hiding behind a pillar. before. <laughs> And, and there was a big furore, yeah. So you say that the pa this Russian paper contained sort of an ob objective error. Uh, it was an objective error. So they, yes, because another Russian called Belinsky, who got involved, and Belinsky, I think it was Belinsky who found the mistake. I don't know directly, but the improved paper was written by, by Belinsky as well, called BKR, so it was Belinsky, Kalatnikov, and Lyshitz. I see. So they wrote an improved paper. It was never clear whether the kind of model they had was general or not, but they did. A, they considered that yes, it was true that in a general case you would get singularities. So but they agreed with me. Yeah. Alrighty. Um, and so you say that conformal cyclic cosmology is basically a direct extension. Give, yes. You see. Yeah. I mean, the story is more or less this. I mean, I've talk, talked about this a lot. Let me give you the story, basically. You see, I had my theorem. I gave a lecture in King's College London about it in late 64. According to the movie, Theory of Everything, Stephen Hawking was in the lecture getting sparks coming out of his head because he was being inspired by it and all that. In reality, he wasn't there. Hmm. <laughs> in, in, reality, in reality, it's not quite as bad as I say, because in reality, I gave a repeat. Dennis Sharma asked me to give a repeat in Cambridge, which I did. So the repeat lecture... Stephen Hawking was present, and more importantly, I had long discussions with Stephen and with George Ellis afterwards about the, gen the sort of techniques I was using, and Stephen picked up on these techniques very quickly, generalized them in certain directions, wrote several papers on the other problems. So my problem was basically collapse, gravitational collapse. The other problem is go back in time, what about the Big Bang? Is that something you could get rid of by having little wiggles in it? You see, if it's completely uniform, maybe it's uh, singular, but suppose it was complicated and not just like that. 
So Stephen Hawking generalized my techniques and got several sort of host of theorems of this nature, published four papers in the Royal Society, and I got his PhD partly on this. And then he and I collaborated on, on a sort of final paper in the Royal Society. But the thing is, I remember puzzling about this very much because the cosmologists never looked at any of these complicated situations. They're all the complicated kinds of singularities you could have. And I remember I happened to be visiting Princeton. Um, I can't remember exactly when this was, but I was visiting Princeton and people were going off to Stevens Institute in Hoboken, New Jersey, which was quite a frequent thing. There were conferences in, in, in Stevens Institute, and cars used to go from Princeton and from, from Syracuse, which was another center where people worked on general relativity. Hmm. And so I remember seeing Jim Peebles in the back of the car, and he was about to go off in this car. I went off in another car, but I just thought I'd take this opportunity. And so I said to Jim, and I said, look, why don't you cosmologists look at all these other models? I mean, you just spend your time with this very simple, straightforward, symmetrical kind of model that people studied in, way back in the very early um, 19, whatever it was. It's, and why don't you look at the, all these other much more interesting, complicated models that you can have? And he looked at me, and he said, because the universe is not like that. And I thought, my God, it's not like that, is it? There's some reason why none of these complicated models actually there in the Big Bang. The Big Bang, although all the techniques that Stephen was using and everything are symmetrical one way or the other in time, in reality, it's extremely different. The, the, the singularities in black holes are these wild, the, the thing called the vial curvature, which is the gravitational degrees of freedom, if you like, that goes completely wild, wild vial. So you, you get that. And that's what you see in these Lipschitz, Belinsky, Kalatnikov models. You see the vial curvature oscillating in a completely mad way. And that's nothing like what you see in the Big Bang. What you see in the Big Bang is the vial curvature seems to be zero. Now, when you were talking about the... the uh, cosmic microwave background, being uniform and all this. That's part of the story. You see, I began asking this question. Why is it... I, I often would phrase this in terms of, a, say, a gas in a box. If you have a gas in a box, and you imagine... I would have, say, four pictures at the top. One with the gas being all in a little smaller, much smaller box first. And then you open the, open the door, and it spreads out through the, through the box. So you see, one, two, three, four, it gets more and more uniform as time goes on. And that's the entropy increasing, too. You can see the randomness is increasing as the gas spreads out through the box. Underneath that, you see four more pictures. These are the pictures of a completely different scale now. I'm thinking of a galactic scale box with a lot of stars running around in it. Stars off with it very uniform now. And then it's the other way around. As things start to gravitate and clump, they get more and more irregular until you've got black holes and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's still time progressing from left to right, but the picture looks the exact opposite. That is to say, with, a, with most materials, gas in the box, what have you, you start with non-uniformity and then it gets more and more uniform as the entropy increasing, as the randomness increases. However, if it's a gravitating bodies, it gets less and less uniform as the randomness increases and it ends up with these black holes where the entropy goes absolutely shooting up. When I say entropy, I just think of that as randomness. It's a technical term for randomness. The entropy goes shooting up into an enormous factor. So what you see, how did the universe start off? Okay, it was very uniform. And here's where I think you were, what the question you were talking about. When you have a cosmic microwave background, I think this was the Kobe satellite which first looked at this, where you see the very, very, not just uniformity, but the temperature distribution is basically a Planck curve. That means 
there's a distribution of how many fast particles there are and how many slower particles there are. And it's, it's a maximum entropy state, and you get this very characteristic curve, which Max Planck worked out in the turn of the 19th to 20th century, um, for a what's called a black body. So it's a sort of a completely random situation. And you see this Planck curve when it's at maximum entropy, completely random. And what do they see in the microwave background? They see a Planck curve to an extraordinary precision. You can put the error, uh, error bars down and you can see it's within the error bars. But the error bars are a factor of 500, too big. So you read the actual error bars are hugging with the incline. So it's, you have this incline which shows you how closely the cosmic microwave background is random. Hmm. Now you see, I regard this as the elephant in the room or the diplodic, diplodicus in the room or the Tyrannosaurus in the room, whatever it is, because you go back and back in time. As you go back in time, you see, the second law of thermodynamics tells you that entropy increases, randomness increases. So you go back and back and back and back in time. What's the earliest thing you ever see? You see the microwave background. And you look at it, and it's maximum entropy. How can it have gone down and down and down and down until it reaches a maximum? Ridiculous. It's just an elephant in the room. I think people were confused because they were thinking of the expansion. And if you think about it seriously, that doesn't make any difference. That's not the point. The point is that the entropy was very high in the matter. Where it was low was in the sockets lower part of these pictures, where you see the stars collecting together. The gravitational degrees of freedom were not at maximum entropy. They were at minimum entropy. So we've got this very, very curious initial state. Never, people never came up, I never understood why people didn't puzzle about this some more, because it just seems to be so blatantly obvious that you've got, at the beginning, that we, as far back as we can see, in other words, the micro background, directly see, you see this complete contrast between the matter and radiation being totally thermalized, being maximum entropy, being as random as it can be, and the gravity being completely the opposite, being completely unthermalized, being at least entropy as it can be, because uniform means low entropy for gravity. Mm-hmm. And it seemed to me an obvious point, and why weren't people going around and shouting from the hills as stuff? And they don't, they just sort of turned a blind eye. I used to lecture about this a lot. You know, various people took me seriously, Simon in particular, I remember. Really? Sure. So that's not the answer. The answer is that there was something very special about the Big Bang. This is the, the James Peebles point that he was making to me. I mean, when I said, why, why isn't the universe like all these other ones? Well, the universe is not like that. It's not why is it not like that. It just isn't like that. That's just to say, it's not as random as it can be. It's a very, very special initial state. So we're presented with this. It's now people invent inflation, and it's supposed to be the answer. They say, oh, well, this very early stage of the universe, and that's wound it all out and made it flat with pancake. Yeah. No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for very simple reasons. You just turn the clock around and you'll see what happens to the collapsing universe. You can put the infraton field in if you like. It doesn't do a damn thing. It's not the answer. But it was conventional. I think as a psychological point, the introduction of this notion of inflation. Are you aware of inflation? Is this something you know about? Well, I've heard about it a lot in my preparation for this interview it's but it's exactly like you say it's it's the big bangers explanation for what they're seeing that's right because there is there is a rationale behind inflation i can see why they do introduce it which is not really this the explanation it doesn't get around the universe out and that's not so hard to see just by looking at a reverse design model and you can see why it won't but but it does do other things and you can see the driving force behind it so it's not that stupid a thing to do. It's just, it's, it's a stretch of the imagination. But it's a stretch of the imagination that most cosmologists had deferred, prepared to stretch. Right, so... so they, take, they take inflation on board. It's, I think it's wrong. 
there's so what you're saying is there's basically a rather large assumption built into this uh, Big Bang model that people use. Yes. Okay. Yes, and this, and this enables you to, to introduce inflation and to have this inflationary phase, which most cosmologists accept as standard. Now, you see, I don't accept the standard. Mm-hmm. I don't remember the, the civil historian. I think I, I wrote papers about why inflation didn't earn the universe out. I certainly have done that. But nobody paid any attention to that. Mm-hmm. So I just thought, well, maybe you know, some other reason for the micro background um, scale invariant spectrum that people seem to see. I didn't think too much about it. Probably it was useful not to know too much about it, I think. Mm-hmm. But I was concerned much more about the degrees of freedom, the gravitational degrees of freedom being completely suppressed. And initially, I just went around postulating, I had a thing called the vile curvature hypothesis, which is just a hypothesis, which says the singularities in the past have got to have zero vile curvature. Those in the future can have whatever vile curvature they like. Just a hypothesis. Um. One of my students, that was Paul Todd, T-O-D with only one D, Mm. Um, he, he's a very good student of mine, and he formulated the way in which the early universe was special in a different way from the way I'd publicized. I said the bar curvature is zero. He said, why don't we say it a little differently? Why don't we say that you could conformally extend the universe to beyond the Big Bang? So this kind of trick... In the other direction, there's something I'd used for a long time, and I told the students all about the other way. This is squashing infinity down. So if you want to squash the remote future down, if you want to study gravitational radiation and all sorts of things, it's a very nice little trick to use a conformal picture where you squash down infinity and make it somewhere you can look at and do calculations. And it's very handy to have these Escher pictures, these things called circle limits. Do you know those things there? Uh, which is by the Dutch artist M.C. Escher. Yes, I am familiar with that. And they're called circle limits. There are five of them, I think. Circle limit one, circle limit two. I often use the very first one because it's the most primitive in a sense. And you can see the, the mathematics involved. The most famous one, I think, is this last one, which I think is circle limit five, with a lot of angels and devils. Mm-hmm. And they interlock. And you can see that as you get round to the edge, there's a circle boundary to the the world of the angels and the devils. And they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And they crowd in along the edge. That's their infinity. So it's a good way of represent, representing the infinity of the universe of these angels and devils. But to us, looking at it from the outside, that looks like just like a boundary. So you've just got the circle boundary. And you could certainly imagine them taking a line and going outside, extending from the inside to the outside. So the idea of, of sort of in principle extending from infinity to something else was part of the techniques which we used to use. And I would talk my students about it. And if you're talking about radiation, it's a really handy trick. A trick, mathematical trick that enables you to talk about infinity by squashing it down and making it into a conformal boundary. When I say conformal, that means that the squashing is in the small equal all the way around. And you can see it best in that first Azure picture. If you can look at circle limit one, if you can access that, and you look at the eyes of a fish, and you see the exact circles, no matter how close they are to the edge. So the thing is that conformal means you don't care how big something is, but you care about the angles right. on its boundary. That's really what conformal means. Or if you like scale, small shapes. Scale loses its meaning, right? Is what you're saying? Yes, sorry? So the scale of things is sort of meaningless in that universe? Or in that, that, yes, uh, that's right. Model. Yes, big and small. You have to be slightly careful because you can make it bigger in some places and smaller, smaller than others. So it's not just a unit. But that's true in the Escher pictures. But even though they're eyes still remain circles. The shape of the fish, you can see, gets slightly distorted as you get towards the edge, but the angles are all the same. So the angles on the fins, whatever it is, mm-hmm. they remain the same, no matter how small they are. So small shapes are accurately depicted. 
that the size is not accurate. The size can be squashed, big or small. That's so, absolutely right. Okay. So I'm saying that conformal geometry is in a certain sense more primitive than Euclidean or Riemannian geometry, where you've got a metric, you've got a concept of distance. I'm saying, okay, the distance is secondary. You really should be looking at the angles. And in relativity, that means in velocity, if you like. If you're thinking about velocities, you're thinking about um, um, the velocity of light in particular. That's really what it means. The velocity of light is given to you, and you squash it or you stretch it, and that velocity of light remains, looks like the same. So, <laughs> no matter how big it is. So you're saying that uh, conformal geometry is sort of more fundamental than Euclid Euclidean geometry because yes. Euclidean has angles and distances, but uh, conformal geometry just has angles. That's just angles. That's right. Yes, that is right. Yes, yes. Okay. Basically correct. Um, yes. And I, I had brought myself up a bit on conformal geometry. I used to play with it, circle with geometry of circles and all that. Yeah, it was great fun. There's a, there's a lot of interesting geometry, which is conformal geometry, and people never learn this at school because they just learn Euclidean. I mean, okay, if you're measuring, your, you want to make a constructor con kitchen <laughs> um, area in your, in, your, in your house, and you've got a mm -hmm. distance because the, you've got massive material. You see, if you've got massive, the whole point is mass is what determines the scale. And this is very, very fundamental. I often stress this point. I don't know why other people don't, because it's very, very fundamental. The two most famous formulae of 20th century physics. What are they? Einstein's E equals MC squared, of course. That tells you energy and mass are equivalent. C is just a velocity of light, so it's constant. Forget about the constant. Energy and mass are equivalent. That's Einstein. Mm -hmm. Even before Einstein, was Planck, Max Planck. He had a formula, perhaps not so famous as Einstein, but it should have been. E equals H nu, or HF, depends what people use these days, HF perhaps. E is energy, it's just as before. H is now constant, that's Planck's constant. And F, or nu, is a frequency. So that tells you that energy and frequency are equivalent. And when I talked about the, the uh, black body radiation in the Planck curve and all that's all to do with it. That, that's where it all came from. And so it tells you that energy comes in these little parcels uh, of a definite, given the frequency, then it's, and it's just, well, little parcels of energy. Mm -hmm. So the frequency means that it's got a little definite amount of energy which is proportional to that frequency. And that's the basis of quantum mechanics. Well, well another basis. And, Superposition principle of one of the bases is. Okay. And, uh, and so in, there's no scale without mass, and. Uh, without mass, you don't scale. That's right. So you have no. There's no. The, the mass gives you the scale, mass and frequency equivalent. So once you've got a frequency, you've got clocks, you've got times. Once you've got times, you've got distances. Because you can use the speed of light to give you a distance once you have a time. So that when you've got mass, then you've got the scale. And so does this so have. Where is it that you might not have mass? The end of the okay, universe, the, right? The very remote future. So that was where it starts. The very remote future, when it's just a lot of photons running on. Now I'm slightly cheating here because there are some, some uh, maybe sort of free electrons and protons running around in plasma. Mm -hmm. You might have um, hydrogen atoms. So you, I have a slight. That's a slight cheat. The resolution of the cheat is to make a hypothesis, which is that in the remote future, there is a fade-out of mass. There is a sort of theoretical reason for this. It's not as strong as I would like, but you have to take my... my if you want to believe in CCC, you've got to believe pretty well that the mass, the mass will eventually fade out. Okay, photons are, are the dominant. Mm -hmm. so that for the most part, it's photons anyway. But you really have to get rid of the mass too, and that's a little bit of. I have heard people say it's the weakest point in the theory, and I agree with that. It is the weakest point in the theory. Okay. But if that's all, I don't mind, <laughs> okay. because the mass fade-out is not an unreasonable. That is to say that if you have a massive particle, and it's on its own, after many, many uh, millions of years, 
your mass will begin to fade away and it will become zero mass. There are particle physics reasons that this could be true. Okay. But I you, don't uh, think you, I claim them very strongly, but, but I think it, it's not unreasonable. So there is this um, slight weak point, you say, but you are satisfied yes. with uh, conformal cyclic cosmology. Very, very, it's a pretty unweak point compared with the assumptions many people make. Right. So I was going to say uh, the reason that you know you go with conformal cyclic cosmology rather than something else is because it actually lines up with the observations that we make. Yes, I should explain the other part of the theory, which is, which is a pretty much a stronger argument actually, is what about the other end? That's the Big Bang. So I'm, I'm allowing to, to squash down infinity and make it a nice finite boundary. That's, that's, as I say, there's a little bit of an assumption there. But what about the Big Bang? Am I allowed to stretch it out? What about all those massive particles in the early universe? Well, it gets so hot. These things whiz around at such an enormous speed. The temperature becomes hugely enormous, which means that the energies of the particles are almost entirely in their, ma in their motion. This is E equals MC squared again. It's the motion of the particles which contributes to their mass. The mass is a trivial addition to it. The closer and closer you get to the Big Bang, the less and less the mass makes any difference. So every particle in the limit as you get to the Big Bang is massless. There's a bit of an assumption there, not much of one, not compared to the other one. Okay. But yeah, I have to make that explicit. Okay. That as you approach the Big Bang, as the temperature, in the, in the limit of infinite temperatures, the mass is in effect zero. Okay. So therefore you have conformal geometry at both ends. And then you begin to wonder about, well, what about the fact that the, in the remote future it's very, very cold, very rarefied, and in the Big Bang it's very hot, very dense. Well, those things just go scale away in 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 the opposite way from the distance scale, so it's completely consistent. Once you squash squash down the cold thing, it becomes hot, and squash down the rarefied thing, it becomes dense. And the way it does it is just consistent with the with the equation. So okay, so if you squash down the remote future, it may be very rarefied and cold, but it's very similar to stretching out the Big Bang. It may be very hot, and very dense. But once you stretch it out, it becomes very similar to the, what you do to the remote future. So this was a big motivation for me. I thought, gosh, they look rather similar. The squashed yeah. remote future and the stretched Big Bang have a good chance of matching. So the idea of CCC came about, conformal cyclic cosmology, that the stretched Big Bang would match on to a squashed remote future. Hmm. And the join is physically okay because you just have massless physics there. Now, you've got to work out the physics of the join, and there are slightly different ways of doing this, which um, make very slight differences to the picture, but not that much of a difference. Hmm. So, uh, but several people have worked, Paul Todd in particular, myself, and another, myself, and people like Jörg Fahrendien in New Zealand, and um, various other people have worked out possible ideas about getting the equations across from Ontario. They don't make a huge amount of difference. My colleague, Christoph Meisner, who's joined with me on it, well, yes, I should explain. Observations, yes, indeed. The first, so I began to think, well, you know, I can lecture forever on this model because nobody will ever prove me wrong. <laughs> and then I mm -hmm. began thinking, whoops, maybe they can. Because, and the first thing I thought of was what about supermassive black holes colliding with each other? Hmm. You see, our, our galaxy has a black hole. That was the two people who shared the Nobel Prize with me. They have these wonderful <laughs> pictures of stars going around this black hole in the middle. It's amazing, amazing pictures. Hmm. And that tells us there really is a black hole at the center of our galaxy. What about the Andromeda galaxy? It's got a much bigger one. Hmm. What about us? and the Andromeda, well, we're going to collide with it in a few thousand million years, I don't know quite how long, but we are heading for each other. So when we, head, when we collide, the black holes will no doubt not hit each other, but they will feel each other out, and as the galaxy settles down and starts to 
form one big conglomeration of the two of us, mainly in Robert, I'm afraid to say. But um, the black holes will peel each other out and they will spiral in and swallow each other up, mainly us being swallowed by Andromeda, but it's a mutual thing in general. Mm -hmm. As this happens, there will be a burst of gravitational radiation of enormous intensity. This radiation will go out and out and out and out and get lost in the expansion of the universe. But when you do the conformal squashing, it comes back again. We won't see that, that explosion, but we could see the collisions between black holes in the previous eon. So you would expect to see in the history of galactic clusters, if they are like the ones in our eon, when I use the word eon, A-E-O-N, I mean from Big Bang to remote future. Mm. But then it happens again, eon, eon, eon. That's the idea. The remote future of each, each eon becomes the Big Bang of the next. And you have to have a where I've described the equation is getting across, getting across. But the gravitational wave signals ought to get across. So if you have these collisions between supermassive black holes, they would produce regions of slightly raised or slightly lower temperature or slightly more uniform temperature, which is what Vahe goes had done. Some people in Princeton tried to look for these things and and then look for it in a way which, had I known more about it, I would have said that's a stupid way of doing it. No, I have to be careful my my language here. It wasn't stupid. It was just they shouldn't have done it that way. Okay. There was a way of doing it. And when I, and then I talked to Fahir Gurzijan, who's an Armenian, who I used to know for other reasons. And he did it a different way. And when I saw the way he'd done it, I said, oh, if you're doing it that way, then you might be able to see if these rings which you seem to see, which the claim might be the collisions between supermassive black holes, that this happens several times, because in one galactic cluster, you will see it happens not just once, but bang, bang, bang. Okay, we get swallowed by the Andromeda, but then there's another galaxy in our cluster which will get swallowed by that one or something, and it happens a few times. So you'd expect to see it in one galactic cluster several times. And these will look like rings which are concentric. And Vahe looks for these things and he finds them. And the Polish people, somewhat later, headed by Krzysztof Meisner, um, Pavel, Pavel Nirovsky, Krzysztof Meisner, Pavel Nirovsky, the early papers had a Polish colleague who did the computer calculations. The latest papers had Daniel Ann, A.N., who is a... Uh, South Korean who now lives in New York and uh, he did the calculations, uh, computer calculations. But the, the analysis, the method of analysis was due to Christoph. The theory was mine and, and Pavel did some work on it too. Okay. And, so uh, these rings, what do you mean when you say that we see these rings? Like, uh, can you describe for the, the layman? You mean you point a telescope up, you know, in, in the... Uh... You'd have to do in the CMB. Okay, you so... You would have to see them... When I say see, you don't see them with our, in the kind of light that we see. You have to see microwave radiation. Right. And what... You see, the, the Polish people looked slightly differently. They were looking at rings which were either slightly warmer or slightly cooler. You have to look at the theory. The theory tells you that the, the slightly... Cooler ones are the close, closer ones. I don't really want to go into it. But the slightly more distant ones would be the slightly warmer ones. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it works. You know, you'd have to, I'd have to go through the argument to show you it's that way around. Sure. The slightly more distant ones are slightly warmer. So he looked for anomalously warm rings, individual rings. And they found, with a confidence level of 99.4%, Hmm. I think that was at 99.4% confidence, which is fairly impressive, not utterly convincing, but fairly impressive. Well, yeah. he didn't do it that way. He, oh, I, there's a complicated story, which I'm just not going to go into. But he did it a different way, and seeing that if you lose them if you twist the sky, so it's in elliptical shapes. There are far fewer of them. Yeah. And that's what we did. Okay. Um, and he noticed that there was a, a very clumped, it's very pronounced how they're not uniform across the sky. 
So if they're not these things, somebody's going to explain what they are, and it's it's not not consistent with conventional what people call the cosmological principle, which uh-huh. is that the sky, if it got to a big enough scale, it, it looks the same wherever you look. Right. Not quite true. And uh-huh. some other people have been looking at quasars, and they find it's not true in the quasar distributions. Hmm. So the universe is not that not as uniform as people think. But you see this particularly in Vahe's pictures, mainly the ones from the from the Planck satellite. That's not the original, the original satellite we looked at was the one called W map, and then the Planck satellite is a bit more refined. Okay. And the the last paper was one published by myself and Christoph Meisner. Pavel Nirovsky and Daniel Ann in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, which is the most distinguished journal of astrophysical processes, I think that's so. Mm. It was published about a year ago, and we are talking about a different effect, what I have called hawking points. You see, what happens to a supermassive black hole? Well, it swallows a whole galactic cluster. Mm-hmm. And it, then it gets sits there, digesting its food or whatever it is. It just sits there and sits there and sits there. And as the universe gets colder and colder and colder, the hawking irradiation from that black hole becomes the hop- hottest thing around. It's ridiculously cold, but the universe is even more ridiculously cold. So that means that the black holes become the hottest things around. So they gradually evaporate away. This evaporation away takes, for the biggest one, something like a Google years, that is 10 to the power 100, or 10 to the power 103, I think was what Don Page said. Mm. That means write down 1 with 103 zeros. Mm -hmm. 1 over that number is the number of years that it takes that number of sorry, sorry, wrong way. that number of years, one followed by 103 zeros, is the length of time it will take for these supermassive black holes to evaporate away. Mm-hmm. However, if infinity is squashed down, you see that all entire radiation squashed into one point. So all the energy that was in that black hole, all the energy that was in that supermassive sorry, black hole, yes, which is in in that galactic cluster pretty well all of it, most of the energy in this like, uh, is squashed into that one point. Squashed into, you have to look at the Escher picture to see that. You look at the little fishes that are right close to the edge, and you imagine all the radiation is concentrating in one of those fish, and they converge on a single point. That single point you don't see because photons don't get through. You have to wait 380,000 years, universe doing what James Peeble says it does. I'm quite happy with that. <laughs> Until you reach 380,000 years and then the photons can finally escape. And how much does one point get spread out in 380,000 years since the Big Bang? About eight times the diameter of the full moon. It's about four degrees across, eight times the diameter of the full moon. So you ought to see spots in the microwave background of that size. Okay. In the paper, in publishing monthly notices, we claim with 99.98% confidence, that's a lot more confidence than the other paper, 99.98% confidence that this effect is genuine. Hmm. That if you look, make the simulations and you look for the effect, you don't see it. Except in one or two when you do 10,000 simulations, or whatever, so I've forgotten the figures now. Anyway, so that's consistent with the probability of these things being a chance effect being, well, 0.0002, whatever it is, percent. Right. I've said it wrong. 0.02 percent. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it's, it's pretty. Slight chance that it's a, it's a pure effect. It seems to be the real. Moreover, you look at the five strongest points. Now, Daniel has another way of looking at the strongest points. Christoph's analysis didn't look for individual points. It looked, looked over the whole sky. 
So Daniel had to do a slightly different way. And he tried to find where the strongest points were. And I'm not sure I believe all of them. But the, the five strongest ones, he then looked in the older data, the W map, there were two quite distinct satellites. They're very different from each other. One was the older W map satellite. The, one was, the other one was the newer Planck satellite. We were mainly looking at the newer one. And you take the six, the five strongest ones in the Planck data, and you look to see in the W map data, and you find Hawking points in exactly the same places. So they're the same spots. So I believe all of them. They're genuine. Then Daniel looked at the next strongest one, I think, in the W map data, and that's also in the Planck data. So it's there too in both data. So I believe those six, those six points, I think, are genuine Hawking points. I'm not sure I believe them all. There may be some chance effects, and they're not necessarily real. Mm -hmm. But I think those six ones have a good case of being genuine Hawking points. In other words, they are the result of the evaporation of a two massive black hole. So I mean, the... it might be something else. I'm not, but that's, that's okay. what I'm saying. And I think you asked me how would you see them. I'd like somebody to do this. So it would be very intriguing. Um. Have you been to a planetarium? You know what I said in my planetarium. Yeah, I have. Okay, now let's imagine a planetarium where instead of using ordinary light, they take take the microwave background but convert it into light that you can see. Mm -hmm. So that you have to scale the radiation up to frequencies that you can actually see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I claim that you would pretty clearly see these six points. They're not points, they are spots which are four degrees across. The, moon, the full moon is half a degree, so these things are eight times the moon's diameter. So I claim that if you looked in a, in a microwave planetarium, just straight, without any monkeying with it, except getting the radiation to a temperature you would actually be able to see, that you'd see the spots. So and you're saying that the human eye point. can actually discern uh, the, yes. the difference in the shades that uh, constitute yes. the spots? Yes, because it's, it's not that small. It's about 10, it's about 15 times brighter than the average variations in temperature. And you're saying that it, multiple satellites have uh, given you this result so it's not a sensor anomaly? Two, two of them. Yes, two satellites have seen yeah, the same. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. Okay. Two satellites have seen the same place, the same spot. Um, so the overall picture of, of what's going on is that uh, you've got this sort of continuous uh, universe, and instead of a Big Bang, yeah. you have these cyc cyclical uh, conformal pinches, and That's right. so you have a series of eons, and uh, the, the, the only thing that can travel from one eon to the next are gravitational waves. Gravitation off or electromagnetic if it's long enough wavelength. And you, uh, you need something like well, like probably like a magnetic field. I think it's quite possible you could see them. I mean that's an interesting uh, challenge to somebody. You see you see magnetic fields in plasmas. In in a galactic cluster you have magnetic fields in the plasma. A plasma, that's electrons and positrons running around loose, mm -hmm. but they, they also run around with magnetic fields attached to them. And these are, these are observed. But I suspect that they would survive mass loss because they don't, they, 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 what can they do? They can only sort of expand out. And then they could get through into the next thing. This, again, is, a, is, an, odd, this is an idea to do to Paul Todd, actually. He, he asked me about it. Could magnetic fields get through? Mm. And I said yes, hmm. because there are magnetic fields which are seen in the voids, and there's no explanation for them, no conventional explanation for them. Hmm. When I say voids, I mean there are certain big regions in, without any galaxies in them. It's so strange why that's the case. If, but in those voids, you do see magnetic fields, apparently. Really? So if, uh, let's imagine that, uh, you know, we could have like perfect... 
uh, surveys or detection of primordial gravitational waves and magnetic fields, what yeah. might might what might we be able to learn about the previous eon if if we could do that? Well, there's already some possibility. I don't know. I don't want to advertise this particularly because it's just an interesting possibility. But I was in contact recently with some people who looking at quasar distributions. These are, you know, quasars are these galaxies, a, a certain stage of a black hole's existence mm -hmm. at the center of a galaxy. It will go wild and produce enormously huge, yeah, mainly radio signals, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm not well up on exactly what they produce, but you produce electromagnetic signals. And they more mainly funneled out along the axis of the rotation of the galaxy. Anyway, if you look for quasars, distant quasars, they are found not to be in a very uniform distribution of clumps in certain areas. So I did ask one of these chaps how, how clumps is it. And he gave me some locations. And one in particular um, looked... You see, I was interested in one of the locations in Vahe's pictures because you might see a big concentration of galactic clusters in certain regions. And I wondered whether you'd see a lot of quasars there too. It seemed a little tantalizing because you do see that this spot, the most concentrated spot they found, is just on the edge of a region where you get the galactic clusters. So I wasn't sure whether that was close enough to jump around or not. It needs looking. I think it needs looking at more. But there, there are various places you might see a signal. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the magnetic fields coming through is one possibility. Okay. And that might be related to quasar distributions. Right. So I think, uh, yeah, I mean, these are the only things we thought about, you know, since the theory's been around, which is about 15 years. I don't see why there couldn't be more exciting things in one form or another. Okay. Um, I just don't know. I'm, I, you need a lot of people to think about these things all at once. Right. Um, and so w when you're talking about uh, uh, CCC, you mention, you know, this sort of problem with people sort of making this assumption about uh, the, the, the microwave background. And, I, you know, whenever I have seen you talk about that, it makes me curious about, you know... How do you think it's possible for such a large oversight to persist? <laughs> well, you see, I guess I've seen other things of that kind. People just get focused on... on I mean, if, if you talk to... I suspect it's a bit like the, the junction between the, the um, 19th and 20th century, when physicists seem to think they'd almost got the whole picture. Mm. And it was just a matter of working out the constants of it to more decimal places. Uh, they'd understood about electromagnetism. That was Maxwell. You see, Maxwell's electromagnetism, and they'd had particles and a lot, got a lot out of Maxwell. And so they thought, well, they got pretty well it. It's just working out these. And then quantum mechanics comes around and relativity, and it completely overturns the whole subject. I mean, it's not, they're not obvious. Certainly, quantum mechanics is highly obvious, but the fact that you get I guess things behaving like particles, when why aren't they behaving like waves, or what are they, particles? I mean, that argument was going on for a long time, way back to Newton and all that. Mm. You know, is light really particles, is it waves? And the answer is it's both. <laughs> I mean, there were arguments for both, and they were good arguments. Right. But the fact that you get interference, that means it's waves. And Newton had a good argument about particles. It's actually a good, not a bad argument. So, and and uh, the fact that it's both at once depending on, on changing one's viewpoint. So I think people can get settled in the wrong ideas for a long time. Um, but you see, cosmology is not that wrong. Most of it is extremely well tested. Right. And I've been at meetings where they say, you know, well, we've got we pretty well know the whole answer. We're not much, well, there might be little details to work out. It's very much like the changeover from the 19th to 20th century, I think. People think we're just a little, you know, getting the Hubble constant a bit more straightened out and this and that. So you, th you well, think I, basically I, that these uh, kinds of oversights um, have, have, you know, are nothing new and that uh, you don't think that in modern academia 
uh, you don't think that new ideas get less of a fair chance than before, maybe a few decades? Them to get. That's an interesting question. I'm not sure. I find that a really tricky one. Mm. Um, it is a very tricky one. I don't know. If you need you need groups to work on these things. I mean, that's one of the big points. You say, well, you can't work individuals and models out of date. You've got to have big teams, and the big teams. You need computers, and people understand how to compute. And there are different people with different things, and you've got to have apparatus, and you've got to make the the apparatus, and you've got to send satellites out, and you've got to design them, and the people have got to oh, huge, complex of complicated skills, and I absolutely appreciate that. So a lot of science will go that way. I mean, you, it, you know, people have these satellites to look at look at Venus, and do you get these? Cos genes or whatever it is, I mean, do you see elements of life there, or don't you, or do what about going to? Right. I mean, there are projects which require huge numbers of people. I perfectly admit that. But then there are things people, you know, like sometimes people sort of see that in a way one's looking in the wrong direction. Hmm. I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, quantum gravity. <laughs> I think most of these things are looking in the wrong direction. But it's not because people are stupid. I mean, some of the cleverest people there are absolutely work on these things. I mean, take about some of these things people work on string theory. That's a good example. In string theory, you see, I can look at this from two, two ends. I can see that string theory has had an enormous effect on certain areas of mathematics. It's revolutionized them. There's no question about it. Mm-hmm. In fact, my successor, um, Philip Candila, Kate Candila, who works on one of these things, and you could see how taking ideas from string theory, you could make big, big progress in certain ideas in mathematics. And that's true. But is that physics? See, it's not at all clear. I, I got turned off. I, when I first heard about string theory, I rather liked the idea. Yeah, strings are attractive, and I could see the mathematical beauty in them. But I got turned off as soon as they said, oh, well, it doesn't work unless you're in 28, 26 dimensions. And okay, then if it was super symmetric, you could do it in 10 dimensions, and a mixture of 10 and 26 at the same time. So I just thought, God, I'll give up. It's not that. That's not right. <laughs> mm. You can't hide all those dimensions and pretend they're, they're sort of hiding in some tiny little distances. It didn't make sense to me. But still, those ideas have had a big effect on mathematics. Now, um, do they affect physics? I don't know. I don't see them. I think it's a lot of misguided in a certain sense. And it's partly because when you're looking at quantum gravity, you think about these very, very high curvatures in black holes. And these are when the vial curvature starts to go wild, and sure, we can't make any sense of that without a quantum gravity theory. Actually, that's probably true. But that's not where the progress is to be made, because you've got to look at the other end of it. I the CCC, which is on the other end of it, you're looking at, at the Big Bang, and can you resolve that in a completely different way? And what about the, the singularities in black holes, where people start talking about Things like, uh, or what are they called? Um, there were some new things, new names I've heard. Far, firewalls. See, if you try to preserve unitarity, that means, see, if you try to prove, yeah, here's an example. You try to con- con- keep to the Schrodinger equation. You say, okay, you mustn't violate the Schrodinger equation. I mean, Schrodinger was much more broad-minded about his own equation. But mm. people get very dogmatic about that. They don't call it the Schrodinger equation. They call it unitarity. Okay, unitarity more or less means, okay, a bit of jumbling around, but it more or less means the Schrodinger equation. Okay. Unitarity is dogma, you see. Think about black holes. If they do, they lose information. They can't, because that violates unitarity. It's It's... You see, the unitarity has a strong, it's, it's enormously powerful, but it's enormously powerful at small things, where the curvatures of space-time aren't big. When I say small things, they could be very energetic things, 
particle physics depends on it. It's very, very important in particle physics. But you're looking, you're not looking at where state reduction becomes important. There's a huge area of quantum mechanics which holds together. And it's all part of unitarity and quantum mechanics, and it's an enormous subject. And if you're doing high-energy physics and you're looking at how particles whack into each other at a huge speed, sure, it's an important dominating feature in the, in, the, in the subject. But what I'm calling dogma, if you like, and maybe it's too strong a word, is to extend that notion to a very different area of interest. We are not looking at high energy. You're not looking at banging particles at higher and higher energies at each other. You're looking at very big things. You're looking at black holes. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at where general relativity is dominating. And to have a theory where general relativity dominates and you also have unitarity, okay, that's the direction that many people go in because they don't believe in state reduction. But I'm saying, why should we believe in quantum mechanics at that level? Because it doesn't make sense at that level. Mm. And I can quote authority if I like. I can say Einstein, Schrodinger, and Dirac. But that's not such a good idea. <laughs> you want to say, why are they right? And Niels Bohr and uh, Wigner, or I don't know who the other people are, Heisenberg, are, are, are wrong. I mean, mm. it's more polite, you see. <laughs> the people who argued these things in the old days were saying that Einstein and Schrodinger were saying that quantum mechanics is incomplete. Okay, there's a lot. You see, there's a whole area of quantum mechanics which is enormously powerful. It's just a different area. And that's where you what you're exploring with high energy accelerator systems and all that stuff, you see. Sure. And you probably don't expect to see unitarity. Maybe they will in some very subtle experiment, I don't know. But you don't expect to see it violated. That's not where the state reduction is, is showing itself. Hmm. It's showing itself either in specially designed experiments where there are some, and a lot of respect for these I have. Maybe they will see this effect in doable experiments. Quite mm. possible. But I'm doing doing done experiments. Well, I mean, a chap who worked on these things for years, Dirk Barmister. He, he always seemed to be just short of getting to the level where he'd see it. I don't know. He may still. He might well be the first to see it. Right. When I say it, I mean violations of quantum mechanics mm. to show that, that you have to go one step further and that the reduction of the state is an objective phenomenon. Okay. But you see people who work with, with the power of unitarity and so on get completely transfixed by that. And they say, well, this is so, such a wonderful theory, you can't monkey with it. Hmm. Well, we've seen this before. We've seen Newton, Newton in mechanics. It's such a wonderful theory, you can't monkey with it. Well... It got monkeyed with, and it, if you monkey with it the right way, you get it right. But lots of people try it the wrong way, sure. That's so, inevitable. So you're saying that they may have lost sight of the fact that science is a uh, uh, perpetual cycle of uh, renewal and one model yeah. overriding the you know the previous one. Yes. No, I would expect to see, I hope to live to see it, I don't know whether I will, the... the see the flaws in quantum mechanics revealed in experiments. Hmm. I really love to see that. When Do you, you think see that... In uh, yes. so, is academic output... Uh, is the volume large enough? Are we doing things, you know... Uh, are we making progress quickly enough to, to see anything anytime soon? It's, it's marginal at current technology. I'm, I'm no expert on the tech... I just talk to people... But you see, Dirk Barmister, who's worked for many years, I think, I can't remember when, when we first talked about it, we put up an idea for an experiment, which he's still doing after, I don't know, 15 years or perhaps longer now, of putting a little tiny mirror, which is about a tenth of the thickness of a human hair. It's a little cube, which is about 10 microns cube, I think, I can't remember. So a tenth of the thickness of a human hair and you hit it with a 
a beam split photon. So you take a photon and you put it very, very carefully curved mirrors and things mm. where the photon, single photon, bounces on this little mirror about a million times. So it's reflected backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And one million times hit of that visible light photon or something like that is just enough to move it. So you beam split the photon, so it's only half a photon if you like. You keep the other, see the photon is split into two, two individual states. One is kept in a cavity, so it's reflected backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. You keep it there, you know, for a good second. <laughs> and the other one is in another cavity where you reflect it backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, where one of the mirrors in this cavity is this little tiny mirror. Now, as it slightly starts to move that mirror by, by the impact of the photons, it will get out of kilter with the photon, its, its mate, in other words, its other self, mm. the other part of its wave function, which is in the other cavity. And then you bring them together, and can you see the loss of coherence? Mm -hmm. And that's an experiment which Dirk has been doing for, I would say, about at least 15 years. And so when you talk the to him about... I, Sorry? I was just the last time I talked to him, which was a, he gave a seminar at Oxford, but he was somewhere else in a virtual seminar. And he encountered, encountered some difficulties about keeping the temperature low enough or something. I can't tell what it was. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how optimistic he was about tomorrow getting the experiment to work. But it was more like within the next five years. Mm. Well, you know... Um, despite any kind of oversights or dogma, you know, the uh, truth uh, prevails in the scientific uh, method, right? Yeah, so right. I think there's cause for... If it comes out the wrong way for me, I have to bend them and, and they'll say, I was wrong. Right. And I hope I have the courage to say that. I'll probably say, look, you didn't do it quite well enough because you needed a little more of this and that, and you probably said, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I shouldn't. I should take, I should take my... my Dennis Sharma, I have a great admiration for him because he was converting everybody to the steady state theory, including me. And then the point came when the Penzias and Wilson saw the microwave background. And after a few struggles to try and make it some other extension of the theory work, he said, I was wrong. That's him talking, not me. <laughs> he went and gave lectures to say that the theory he was talking about previously was wrong. He was mistaken. Now we should put our energies into going in a different direction. I thought that was amazing. Hmm. And I've always been tremendously admir admirer of his ability to to be true to his science, if you like. Yeah, certainly not, not every scientist would uh, be able to swallow that pill and be so honorable about it. Certainly. Absolutely, absolutely. So I hope if my pill comes, I will now take the other honorable choice and if these experiments are done and they show that it's there is no state reduction there i will have to go and scratch my head and say there must be another answer what on earth is it <laughs> well whether or not your predictions are correct i think your contribution uh not just the one that got you a nobel prize but all of your contributions uh are incredibly valuable so and you know <laughs> Yeah, so speaking of that, I am incredibly fortunate to have had been able to talk to you, uh, especially for this length of time, and, you know, I can't tell you how, how much I appreciate it. it. So it was a huge honor to talk to you, and, and thank you very much for your time today. I'm not at all. It's a great pleasure. Thanks.